Well, hello everyone, and welcome to Depth Insights, where we take a depth psychological look at news and events that are going on in your world. I'm your host, Bonnie Bright, and I'm also the founder of Depth Psychology Alliance, which is an online community for everyone who is interested in Jungian and depth psychologies. And we invite you to come join us there at www.depthpsychologyalliance.com. And you can also join our Facebook group by looking up Depth Psychology Alliance. And I'm very excited to be here with my guest today, Michael Malura. Welcome, Michael. Glad to have you with me. Thank you for having me. Well, it's very exciting because we are going to be talking about something that is extremely unique. And I have never heard of this particular topic before until I met you, Michael. And I'm going to share with everybody a little bit more about your bio first so that people know where you're coming from. And then we'll dig right into the topic. Okay. Dr. Michael Malura is currently in private practice full-time in Beverly Hills, California, and he also holds workshops and discussions that address the importance of mindfulness, creativity, meditation, yogic practices, and dream consciousness to bring joy into our everyday lives. He first received an MA from New York University specializing in performance studies, and Michael followed that degree by earning an MFA in the study of music as a healing modality and images from the University of Miami. So I assume that's both um, healing uh, music and images as healing modalities, Michael. I, I think that we'll get into that quite quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, let me continue. Dr. Malura received his PhD in clinical psychology from Pacific Graduate Institute and completed both his internship and postdoctoral training at the Wright Institute of Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. His main orientations are union and self-psychology. Dr. Malura has a firm, positive reputation in the spiritual community of Los Angeles and takes pride in his availability and commitment to making magical transformations take place in the lives of all his clients, colleagues, and friends. He brings 30 years of education and spiritual growth with clinical training to provide a life-affirming, nurturing, creative, and confidential space for real healing to take place. Wow. I just kind of want to take a moment and let that sink in, Michael. That's really a, a very rich and profound story about what it is that you actually do and yet there's so many more details that I want to ask you about. Mm -hmm. um, so let's just jump right into it. I, I wonder if you can start out by just talking to us a little bit about what exactly it is that you're doing within a therapeutic kind of setting that has to do with both music and your clients dreams and this is the idea of actually composing music to go with your clients' dreams. Tell us how you came to this idea because it's very profound. Well, um, most of my background uh, before becoming a psychologist was in music and working with images, whether it was dance work or theater or uh, film. And uh, having that extensive background as a composer, uh, I felt that there was a way of using this work to provide healing for others in some way. I always had the interest in dream work because I had a very active imagination, a very active dream life. And the idea of putting music to dreams really isn't my idea. It goes back thousands of years. It's a long tradition in various cultures, specifically more like uh, the Asian cultures like China, and then uh, even going back to ancient Greece, there was a lot of work in doing dreams and music and, and actually combining the two uh, in various ways in order to understand dreams. I did extensive scholarly research about uh, dreams and how they've played out in different cultures. And uh, when the idea hit me to become a psychologist, which is something I always really wanted to do, even though I was working as a, as a composer, um, it had come up in my studies and certainly in studying Jung specifically and his Red Book work, uh, that the idea of there being sort of an active imagination process of working with the unconscious and using other materials to access the unconscious. In his case, he used a lot of drawings and uh, mandalas and so forth in order to really uh, give images of the unconscious a depth. 
uh, I realized that, you know, my contribution to the work would probably have to do with something uh, musical, since I had an extensive background in it. Um, when I was younger, I actually used to compose a lot of music uh, based on dreams I had. Hmm. Um, and I would talk about them with family members and so forth, or friends. And it was always just kind of a hobby or just something I did or something I used for inspiration to work with uh, directors or other artists in various ways. Um, so it was something that was always kind of in my background. Um, but when I went to Pacifica and I discussed my work with people like Dr. Ro Robert Romanishan, um, there was uh, something that sparked in the idea of putting music to images. Mm. Um, the healing component uh, that it, it could potentially uh, access more material from the unconscious was really quite stirring when we discussed it and talked about how something like that could be done. And so I actually did some work with Robert Romanishan, Dr. Robert Romanishan, with a, a video he was presenting called Antarctica. Mm -hmm. And I yeah. composed music to those images, which felt very dreamlike. And he did uh, create a video, I think that's available online, uh, for that and it was really a fascinating experience that kept leading the way towards the work that I wanted to do which was somehow to expand the uh, psychoanalytic frame uh, from not being just talk therapy but being something that reached deeper Mm -hmm. to access a deeper space. Yeah, I'm, I mean, there's so much in what you've just said. I, I'm just noticing a few things, actually, that, that are occurring to me. One is, you know, we all have stressful lives. We have a lot going on. I had a particularly busy morning this morning, and I noticed I was trying to pay attention to my body and how I was holding that stress mm -hmm. and tension or not holding it, as the case yes, may be. And uh, one thing that occurred to me, and I don't always do it, but uh, one thing that occurred to me today, and perhaps it was just kind of an unconscious preparation for us having this conversation, but I have the, uh, access to a small YouTube clip that is a Tibetan bells, and oh. it's a, a beautiful sort of meditative, and I was just, I found myself just craving listening to those bells and that particular mm -hmm. kind of music. So I put that on, and even though I continued to do some of the other things that I needed to do while I was listening to that, I just noticed immediately such a shift. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and there's some, you know, there's some voiceover in it, and, and he's talking, the voice in the um, film is talking about the garden of the heart. And so it started me thinking about my heart space and, and how all that opens up. And it's just, I think that this idea of, of music being able to literally change our state as something that is coming up from the unconscious is probably universal. And as you say, it's, it's often been linked to dreams. And I will say in our, you know, in our depth psychological culture, for those of us who, who are in the field of depth psychology, everybody's interested in dreams, right? It's, it is, um, you know, it is profound work. And a lot of people are offering the option to talk about dreams and to do dream work. And many people offer some really powerful opportunities for that. But when I first met you, and, and I mean, I, I don't really, I can't say that I know you that well, Michael, but I had the opportunity to actually see you uh, in conversation with a patient via some video footage that you shared with me. And this idea of, of composing music that goes with a patient's dream and then being able to bring that back into the, the consulting room somehow is, is just such a, it, it's, it's really avant-garde for, for me. And I think in our culture, I don't know that many people that are doing it. Yeah, that's a good word, actually. The other <laughs> word. It, 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 um, it, it's interesting how that fits into a lot of the work that I have done um, in various ways. Um, the idea really has been how to access uh, a deeper healing for the client, how to meet them, how to, how to embrace what we call empathy and to really manifest it in some way that goes beyond just sitting there and mirroring and reflecting. Um, the idea of actually composing music to a dream report um, really provides this alternative to just really um, kind of just being a passive uh, listener um, 
and takes it into the realm of interactive, collaborative, um, unconscious work um, that opens up the heart in a way that I really haven't seen before. That really excited me when I first started to research this work and I did my dissertation doing this and um, it was profound to see the differences in how it affected the dreams uh, that were being reported um, from research subjects and then now I'm working with clients doing this. Yeah, that, can you just share a little bit about that process just so that people have a, an image of, of what happens for you when you're working with somebody? Kind of what's the step-by-step -step process? How do you know, how do they first uh, explain the dream to you and, and how do you then go about working with it and then reintegrating that back into their experience? Yeah, and uh, it's a good question. I'm glad you're asking because it, I want to make it very clear that what I'm doing is very clinically based and it is about healing. It is about doing the therapeutic um, work that we're being asked to do. When a patient first arrives, uh, I do a, an assessment, you know, I, I actually take some time to get a feel for the patient, to understand their history, to understand why they've come to see me, um, what they're working on in their life. I'm also assessing for any possible um, psychosis or anything that might be of danger uh, to them um, or to, you know, the work that we want to do. And... Um, after I do an assessment, which really is quite extensive, I want to make that really clear because it, it, it is, this work is sensitive. I understand the nature of the frame. I understand the nature of the therapeutic experience. And so I honor it and I respect it. And it's very important to me that it is done clinically correct mm -hmm. you know so we're 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 working together to find where the healing needs, needs to take place right we're not um, talking about some new age kind of um, right exactly process that, exactly. that is not grounded in, in good depth psychology right. because i think a lot of people think it sounds new agey or something like that i'm not doing new agey work at all actually and uh even though i appreciate and respect those people who do healing with shamanistic ideas and so forth, and I honor that as well. But yeah, this work is very clinically based. I do an assessment first, and then I really create an alliance with the patient, through, and we work together for several sessions, um, just like any other alliance would take place. Uh, we get to know each other, get a feel for what's going on, where the trouble is, um, then gradually, I, I set the intention, I say, I tell them and uh, that I'm very interested in dream reports. And if they are dreaming, uh, that's great. If they're not dreaming, I can still work with that. And that's a whole nother part of the process is how to access dreams that are not happening. But we talk a little bit about the dreams that they're having. Um, uh, we get into various contents and ideas. And um, then I, I kind of set the intention. I tell them, I want you to, you know, uh, get a dream book and set it by your bed. And um, anything that comes up, please write it down. And you're going to take this and bring it to therapy um, if they wish. It's not a requirement. It's just something that I, I, I set up. Um, it's funny what happens when you tell the unconscious that I want to remember my dreams because mm -hmm. it starts to happen almost magically. Um, they basic, I allow the dreams then to kind of filter into the work we're doing. And at first, like I said, it starts very much like we're straight up uh, psychodynamic type of work. Uh, then the dreams start to filter into the content. Mm -hmm. You know, they may say, oh, I had a really, really big dream last night that really disturbed me or something like that. And we talk about it. Um, after I really get a feel for their dream uh, activity, um, you know, it, it's kind of uh, said in my informed consent, so forth, that I am interested in doing extensive work with dreams, that when, when something comes up that seems really big, uh, meaningful, but it's disturbing, perplexing, perhaps it's uh, something that they just can't make sense of out of. Uh, and 
and even I'm a little perplexed by it, quite mm-hmm. honestly, you know. I eventually will say, um, okay, maybe this is a good piece to try to dig a little deeper and try to understand the uh, the dream and the images a little bit further because maybe it will tell us a little something more that is not coming up just by us talking about it. So I, what I do, the actual process at that point becomes I record them with permission, of course, um, vocally uh, with a, with a uh, microphone. I, I record them reporting the dream. Uh, then we have the dream on tape. Um, I proceed to uh, place it into um, my software and my work where I compose music. And I create a landscape, and it starts with really creating an environment of what feels like the dream space, uh, what it sounds like. Mm-hmm. And, and by I, that, do you mean certain chords or a certain kind of... Uh, it's tone? really environmental. Um, it would be like chords, pads, environmental feels, whether it's you know, something that first you're going to establish whether it's going to be a classical piece or electronica. Mm. I, I mean, it could be rock and roll. It could be uh, anything, really. But it, you're, base, you're basing this on your own sort of instincts or, or something that has emerged in you from the dream or between you and the client. Yeah, there's a lot of intuition, uh, intuitive function work that's being taken place. Um, but generally speaking, first you start with the dream by establishing what the mood is, mm. what the feeling of the dream is. I actually, you know, then start asking questions like, what do you think the dream sounds like? Um, these questions, in effect, really start the process. Uh, we start talking and thinking about a dream uh, as though it's a piece of art or, um, you know, and it, it is some other uh, manifestation of the unconscious that is quite fascinating when you start asking what is what does a dream sound like it's a very interesting question to ask a client um and that's kind of gets the ball rolling because you know you're getting a feel for it is it gonna be scary is it gonna be magical is it gonna be fairy tale like is it, are it flying dreams or swimming dreams and uh, you know, all the alchemical elements come into play and you get a real feel for where the dream is. And just like a movie, um, you're kind of asking the, the patient, you know, what kind of movie are we about to create on some level, you know? Right. You're really, you're really kind of tapping into some of the archetypal aspects of it by the time and asking them to articulate it. And, you know, some, some therapists I know do that work somatically. So they'll ask you, where do you feel that in your body or or in your body? Actually, that is another question that I do ask. The embodiment of the dream is very important. And actually that's more uh, the type of question that I ask after we go through the music part of it is actually has that moved in the body you know sometimes they say a dream they're feeling it in their neck or in the back of their neck and then after the music is heard they they say i'm now feeling it in their heart oh. and that is exactly the kind of uh, work we're trying to do here is access and open up the heart and the unconscious you're making an alliance uh, with the unconscious that says, I'm not here to destroy you. I'm not here to understand you completely. I'm not here to fix you. I'm here to respect, honor, and experience the unconscious as something sacred and uh, healing and informative. Mm-hmm. Um, so with, you're really with, looking to create movement and create some kind of a relationship between. Exactly. Yeah, it's really about deepening the relationship. Uh, in a different way and moving it in a different way and then collaboratively the I work with the with the patient to literally kind of they become the director of their dream and they're directing me on how I would as a composer uh, put the sounds together and it's very interesting what happens when you start developing this because it's it's not like I come out and I create something and they go oh that's perfect Um, Mm -hmm. I don't want it to be perfect. You know, sometimes I start out with a dream and, uh, and I put, start putting the music to it and they'll say, um, oh, that's nice, but I didn't feel nice at this time. I actually felt terrified. I was scared. It, it needs to be scarier. 
And in that sense, right there, they're telling me something I didn't know about their dream and about their experience of the dream. So we're, we're really going into the idea of the phenomenology of the dream, the lived experience, and trying to understand that lived experience of the dream, how deep it goes, how deep the fear is, how, how the person is responding to the images in the dream. Once the music really starts to unfold, the deeper levels of the unconscious start to reveal itself um, in, through our discussions. Then what happens is eventually an entire piece of music comes up, you know, uh, with everything, with cellos and piano and sound effects and all kinds of stuff to really create the dream musically. Um, and as this happens, they are seeing different things. They're starting to feel different things. And it doesn't even matter if it's accurate. It's, it's whatever they're experiencing, whatever okay. they're adding to the dream is saying something uh, from their unconscious that is re calling for healing. Um, so, for example, it's, it's, it's like... Um, Someone might have a dream where it was in black and white, and then with the music, suddenly they're seeing flashes of red uh, or something like that. And that will say something because then I might ask them to free associate with the red. And th that they start saying, I had red shoes when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. And the next thing you know, it, you know that you're dealing with a dream that might have something to do with their childhood. Right. Yeah. So it really opens up a portal. And I'm just thinking while you're talking about all this, it's so fascinating. But we know in our culture that we often, you know, language is a problem sometimes. We have difficulty actually yeah. articulating emotions, mm -hmm. particularly emotions that are around um, things that are very either deep seated or, or very unconscious for us. Mm -hmm. And of course, if, if you believe that there is a collective unconscious or a, a big S self, as Jung called it, which is pulling us toward, you know, more wholeness and, and greater unity, then it wants these things to come out what better way than to actually use a vehicle like music which has been uh, in, in some ways probably existed long before our capacity to actually speak or articulate uh, exactly. or make sentences and certainly to have the the range of vocabulary and, and capacity to speak as we do now because music comes from nature right it comes from the you know the sound of the birds and the trees and the wind and and all of the things that we hear when we go out into the landscape of the earth and so I'm, I'm really um, just struck by how uh, incredible this can be as a tool to actually bring up those things that we can't possibly begin to articulate. Yes, exactly. I mean, uh, there's been a lot written about the healing aspects of music and how it can be used um, therapeutically, mostly that CBT type of work. Uh, my interest was certainly to bring this into a psychodynamic type of setting and to use it as a psychoanalytic tool. Um, I was very inspired actually by the writing of Nicholas uh, Cook, who talked a lot about what you just mentioned, which is this idea that between words and the expression of, uh, of an object, there's a gap and music lies in the gap and there's an opportunity through music to connect words to images in a way that's deeply expressive, um, in a way that can't be just done with a word. And that's a big part of the process. We're really bridging the gap between consciousness and unconsciousness, feelings, and, um, and that is a big part of the work. Also, it's, it's a lot has to do with the sacred nature of music, like, um, the Sufi mystics um, used music in this way. Um, you know, Jung was very inspired by Corbin, uh, Henry Corbin, and, and that kind of thinking um, is what really inspired me to really think about how can I as a composer really provide a deeper sense of connection, healing, and really honor the sacred nature of dreams because I also felt, and this goes back to something you were talking about earlier, which is the idea of dreams and therapy is actually a problem uh, for a lot of people. It's, I've worked in great institutes with great colleagues, and most of the people that I talk to and work with, 
they do not know how to work with dreams or they don't know how to deal with dreams. And there's a, there isn't that much instruction that can happen with dreams. Um, you really have to have a feel for them. Mm -hmm. True. I really feel it's an important part of the work. It, it's, it's, dreams do come up. Um, and regardless of what your uh, background is, um, it's material. Um, that can be used, and it's telling us something about what is happening unconsciously, which means that it's inaccessible, okay? Mm -hmm. We can't access this material. And, and, and music provides that bridge to that part of whatever is happening with the client or patient. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm curious um, what happens when the once the music is done and and maybe you didn't use that word that's the word i'm using right so mm -hmm. I, in my mind there is a point when you, you did kind of allude to the idea that there would be something more whole that was um maybe not complete but but whole that the client could then listen to do you actually offer that to them that and yes and allow them to like take it home and work with it or how, yes. how do they use that going forward it, it's an ongoing process really um what happens once the piece is is done and there is a point where there is some completion to it um they have two versions of the of the music and i give it to them uh you know on a disc uh cd uh, that they can take home with them uh, the two versions are first is the music put to their voice, uh, which was originally recorded in the dream report. And they can hear themselves reporting the dream with the music so they can follow their own images and understand where the music and what the music is commenting on and so forth. Then the second version is the instrumental version without their voice. And I ask them to work with this at home uh, sit back in a very relaxed space, put on the headphones, uh, and sit there and listen to the music and see what comes up. And I ask them to write down anything that seems interesting or different. Um, and then they come into the next session that I do with them, and we start talking about what else is coming up. You know, it's like I just did a piece with one dream where uh, at first it was just being in a forest. And then after the music was added, the, they saw a witch <laughs> um, flying around the forest. So then we started talking about the witch. Okay. Um, different elements start to come out. And again, it's fun. It's interesting. It's playful. But it's uh, really interactive and interesting because they're feeling involved with the healing process. Absolutely. Yeah. And a big piece of this is the idea that they come out of it with a piece of music that is really theirs. It's, yeah. it's, it's an achievement. And that is also part of the healing process is to be able to have something that they created and they, there's a feeling of accomplishment. Mm -hmm. And um, fa it's fascinating what happens as that continues to develop because then the following dreams they have often comment on previous dreams and we can refer back mm -hmm. uh, uh, to all the different dreams that come up. Yeah, it's almost like that sense of ownership really turns into, um, you know, a representation of me as the client, right? It, it begins to grow. It's like a little seed that begins to sprout and grow and just becomes that um, beautiful sort of soul of the dreamer, of the person who is, is having the dreams. Mm -hmm. I love that. And I was thinking, you know, I, I have this dream kind of in the Martin Luther King sense of, uh, it, uh, how amazing it would be to have morning dream groups in our culture. So, oh, that, you know, I mean, traditionally, a lot of indigenous and earth-based cultures would gather first thing in the morning and share dreams because it was so critical for the community to to understand what was happening. And That's what they used to do in Roman times, actually. Exactly. Families used to have their own dream interpreter. <laughs> yeah, imagine that. I mean, imagine what a difference it would make in our culture. So I'm just loving this extra layer that you're adding to it with the music mm -hmm. because it makes so, so much sense to me and not just from a, a head standpoint, not just from a thinking or a logical standpoint, but also from just an embodied standpoint of how we can. And, and I was thinking it too, obviously people who don't have access to you or your skills, you know, I mean, it's such a gift to be able to compose the music and to have that space or that container in which the two of you can work together as, as client 
and doctor and be able to initiate that healing process. But I suppose people can also, um, just knowing that this is an idea and could be healing, can look for music on their own that sort of represents, will never be as complete as, as what you're doing, clearly. Right, it's a very <laughs> different type of process. But it, it is a different type of process. Yeah. One thing that I, I, I have been asked before, and I think it's important, is, um, you know, some people say to me, well, I'm not a composer, so I, I can't do this type of work. So how do, how might this apply to me if I'm a, I'm a therapist and so forth? Right. And really the inspiration here is that this is about bringing creativity and aliveness to the unconscious. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're coming from the Jungian or death psychology tradition, there are different ways of doing this. Uh, you know, some people do dance embodiment work. Um, or they might actually do uh, painting and uh, interactive work using that. It's really, it's where the soul, where your soul is, seems to be vibrating the highest and applying that to the work to open up more uh, information and connection. And that's what I think I'm bringing to the back um, you know, I think this was bigger uh, when Jung was alive and the Jungians were really kind of experimenting with all kinds of um, active imagination exercises. And I want to make it clear, I'm not the first person to do this type of work. Yes, musically I am. Um, I'm, I'm bringing sound to the the work, which hasn't really been approached. Mm-hmm. But You know, our ancestors have been doing this for many, many years in different ways. And there are ways of doing the kind of work that I'm doing. And and I hope to bring that more uh, to uh, my colleagues and so forth as I continue to develop my work and do workshops. And I'm working on a a book that I will eventually get out there um, as I continue to develop this process. Yeah, that's great. I know um, there's also a documentary being made about your work, which I I don't know what the timeline is on that, but uh, that was, for me, such a compelling piece of it to understand. It's really hard to imagine the process. And and a friend of mine who is a filmmaker I've worked with before, um, you know, when I, when he found out that I was composing music to people's dreams, uh, he said, can I film this? I got to know what this looks okay. like. And I, we, we figured out a way to make that work. And the idea is, yes, to pr- create a film, a documentary of sorts to um, show people exactly how this process uh, un- takes place. Yeah, very compelling. Is there a, um, Michael, is there a story or, or do you have any examples of, of um a way in which you saw this work really shift somebody's life or an instance where something really um, came to light. I don't know how much you can share. Of course, I, you know, I'm not yes. asking you to share, but well, I, I wonder if there's, uh, means, but, <laughs> yeah. but if you could give um, examples maybe of, of, of just um, how you've seen the transformation work. Yeah. Well, it, it's all about how a dream shifts, right? Uh, someone can have a scary dream uh, about walking in a forest, for example. Uh, where the trees are attacking them and the tall trees around them are, are like attacking them. And they, they may describe it first as like just an anxiety experience, fear-based. Uh, and you might ask, you know, what do you think it's about? And it stays in that area of, well, maybe, you know, I'm afraid of being in open spaces or things like that. Um, with the music, uh, what came out was that this person started to recognize or um, started to realize that the dream had more to do with her relationship with grown-ups, And um, the trees that were attacking her were actually type of uh, adults that were not nice to her when she was a child. And it happened that at the deeper we went into the dream content, um, she started to realize that we both started to realize that this dream wasn't about actually walking through a forest, that it was actually about walking through her house as a child at a time when her parents were being divorced and she was having a tough time, uh, because she was being forced to live with one parent versus another parent. And she had at first 
thought that she was very uh, resolved with the issues that came up during this time in her life, but the dream suggested that she was unresolved with that. And we started to realize this was affecting also her experience of intimacy in her life and her inability to find, say, a, a partner and so forth. And again, when on a conscious level, these weren't the things we were talking about. She wasn't suggesting that she had intimacy problems or anything like that. The dream work that we did then suggested that, yes, there's some work here to be done about resolution or re resolving some of the anxiety or, um, uh, I guess, uh, cautiousness that she was taking when it came to relationships. And the work then after became more relational. Um, and so it really directed at that. Then she was able to make um, adjustments. Yeah. And again, it, the dream work directed me to that area. At first, I was working in a completely different area with that particular person. Um, these, and, and that's kind of what happens. is like you start to see different issues um, that need attention. You right. know? But you're saying it was the back and forth um, when you began working with the music within yeah. the dream work right that definitely is what opened it up yes uh, we weren't getting there just talking right and uh again the interpretation of that particular dream was very basic a kind of concrete you know um fear of uh, you know uh, open spaces and yeah. on surface level at least it was right. Right? But as we know dreams have so many multiple layers yeah, there's also the aspect of uh, what happens here in this process, too, is that a personal unconscious experience of a dream also opens up to the archetypal, the collective unconscious mm -hmm. starts to play in. You start to investigate, too, a person's relationship to nature and things like that and how nature has a voice as well in that particular dream. And uh, again, it really does open up this idea that our dreams connect us to a bigger world. Um, and the entire world, including ourselves, is seeking healing as well. So the components really open up to all kinds of different areas here. Um, and I think this is what Jung was talking about uh, in when he really brought Freud's ideas of there being a personal unconscious and then amplifying it to the collective unconscious because uh, dreams do have this uh, incredibly magical ability to connect us all. Because mm -hmm. I started to realize the more I talked about dreams with people, um, all dreams, once it's kind of um, discussed or reported, it's like, oh, I had a dream just like that, but it was this and this and this. And then we all start to connect. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's really fascinating how it brings us all together, including, you know, the earth that needs healing as well. It shows up in dreams all the time. And tsunami dreams, for example, have a lot to do with how we feel in the environment. Mm -hmm. um, and forest dreams, like that particular example I just used, you know, it, it's, it does bring out all kinds of other issues that are impacting our level of consciousness and healing and what we're working on. Yeah, yeah, very, very much the collective. And, you know, it's music as the, the voice of the collective, really. Um, yeah. Music as the voice of the collective dreams, because that, mm -hmm. uh, in the end, it's, we can't deny that we're all interconnected. I think what you're talking about is exactly that, this connection with our environment and with each other, and then music as the way to uh, allow that to come forward. To really yeah, it, it certainly has its impact on the relationship as well, and the transference. And I know I've talked to certain colleagues about issues about transference. And again, it always is informative. Um, and I want to make it clear, you know, sometimes it's not always completely positive. Um, you know, someone will say that that piece of music was great, but it didn't feel like the dream. But again, all of that is still informative. And then we talk about the transference. We talk what's going on between us and how that felt, their voice also uh, against the music. And that's saying something about the therapeutic relationship. It informs me about the work we're doing. And it provides, it's really all about just accessing more materials so we can find where more healing needs to take place. Because this is all about the client. It is about finding ways to, um, to find healing and to uh, find peace 
inside a very kind of chaotic world of our internal mind, you know? So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, isn't that? Yeah. yeah. John Cage used to call music you know, organized noise mm -hmm. and turning it into uh, the collect, uh, actually towards the psychological. And this is what's going on inside our minds. There's a lot of noise, there's a lot of chaos, and music does help provide, I think, something more uh, organized to all of that chaos and beauty. It's also a return to the aesthetic, uh, which Hillman always talked about, which is very important, I think. It's bringing beauty back into this relationship that often gets left out, I think, um, in these days, you know, yes. in the days of the medical model and a lot of the, the work that's being done. This, this is actually a return to old ideas, too, uh, the idea of that um, psychology, uh, therapeutic work can not only be healing, but it's a beautiful experience. It's Absolutely. Experience. Yeah, I think you've just described uh, my version of depth psychology, and I, I, I think that a lot of people would agree. Um, yeah, I, I just have to share the story, Michael. I shared it with you when we first spoke, but I'll, I'll say it again. There's a, a beautiful documentary that I absolutely love. I've owned it for several years because I just bought it as soon as I watched it a few years ago. It's called Climate Refugees. And mm -hmm. as soon as I bought the film, I also bought the soundtrack because I just, that music music was so touching to me. I had never heard anything quite like it. Very haunting and uh, just beautifully um, done with the film itself. And, um, and so I, I frequently have that on my iPad or my iPhone and playing it when I go places. It's something that's very soothing to me and also um, helps me to stay in touch with that initiative because for me, the, the whole idea of climate change and people having to be forced out of their homes because of it uh, is a growing concern and, and definitely is something that is close to my own heart. And when I realized that you were the same person who actually scored that uh, I, I was just uh, awestruck, so I really encourage everybody to go check that out, um, just because it's for the climate and it's also your music. It's really beautiful. Um, people can also find out more about you, Michael, um, at your website, which is michaelmalura.com. So Michael, and then M-O-L-L-U-R-A.com. And um, you also have michaelmaluramusic.com as well. Yes. Uh, of course, w the michaelmalura.com is the psychotherapeutic uh, website, and then the other is the just music. Um, and thank you for that acknowledgement, and thank you for uh, choosing to talk to me today. I really, this is a passion of mine. I'm very excited about this work. I'm excited when I connect with other people who are uh, promoting this idea of death psychology, which I think is on the rise, and the awareness of the different approaches to psychology. And really, thank you for that acknowledgement about climate refugees, because that's a very special uh, score for me personally. And it is about putting music to the soul of uh, the planet, mm -hmm. which is crying out for healing in all various ways. Well, so, uh, thank you so much for the work that you're doing and, and, and turning people on to this work. It's, 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 it's such a, an incredible field. And I'm amazed by how many people don't know a whole lot about it or even that it exists. So this is very important. It's very sweet that you're doing this kind of work. And I really yeah. appreciate it. We Thank you. Well, you know, it seems to attract like-minded others. And I always tell people, it's not really me, right? There's something bigger that is unfolding, I think, uh, into our planet and into our consciousness. And, um, and we're hungry for it, no matter if we know to call it depth psychology or not. There's something exactly. really important here mm -hmm. happening. So you're doing that work as well. And I'm grateful to you. And uh, thank you for so much for spending some of your time with me today, Michael. Well, thank you for having me.